So here we have an optimization problem. We want to maximize 2x1 minus 3x2 plus 4 and that's subject to the following constraint that x1 squared plus x2 squared are small or equal to 16. So the method we're going to use is the Lagrangian uh, um, method and uh, I will lay down six steps you have to go through in uh, in this methodology. The first three are really just stating the right things. In particular, the first one is to define the function or the objective function, right? that what you want to maximize. And we're maximizing here, and we call that F. The second step is to define the constraint, and that shall be called uh, G. And we need the constraint to be large or equal to zero. We'll see that in a moment. Third, we define the Lagrangian function, which will be a combination of f and g. The fourth step is that we will uh, find the uh, first order partial derivatives of the Lagrangian. So we'll find the partial derivatives of the Lagrangian. We're, uh, let's call the Lagrangian capital L. Okay. The next step, step number five, is that we state the necessary condition, meaning the conditions that a potential optimum has to meet. Okay, so it's a range of conditions, we'll need to state them. And then in the last and final step, we will use a little bit of algebra to then find the values of x1 and x2 that meet these conditions. These could be several ones and then we'll see what we do if there are several ones. So let's start with the first step. We'll write down our objective function. That is f x1 x2 is equal to 2x1 minus 3x2 plus 4. That's just given in the question. You will recognize when you look at this that this is linear in x1 and x2, so this is actually a plane. And that means that really there is no unconstrained maximum for that function f of x. That will play a role later. Second, we'll define the constraint. So g of x1 and x2, the constraint is a function of these two, and we reformulate the constraint up there in the following form. We write it as 16 minus x1 squared minus x2 squared has to be larger than zero. Okay, that's in the Lagrangian setup. The constraint will always have to be larger or equal to zero. So next step is we define the Lagrangian function. It's f plus lambda times g, the objective function plus lambda times the constraint. So let's just uh, complete with the information we have. That's equal to 2x1 minus 3x2 plus 4 plus lambda times, and then in parentheses, 16 minus x1 squared minus x2 squared. The next step, step number four is that we want to find the partial derivatives of our Lagrangian function. Uh, so it's the first order partial derivative with respect to x1 and the first order partial derivative with respect to x2. So let's start with this one. So in our Lagrangian we have x1 here and x1 here. This is multiplied by lambda and it has a minus sign so it's 2 and because of this minus sign here, minus lambda times 2 times x1. And then we go to the um, partial derivative with respect to x2. x2 is here and here. Again, it has a minus sign and is pre-multiplied by lambda. So we have negative 3 minus lambda times 2x2. Two so these are our two uh, partial derivatives. Let's proceed to uh, step number five. And you can see so far this is all pretty simple. Of course, these partial derivatives could be more complicated in other cases. Now the real interesting work starts. So let's state the necessary conditions. They are that the first partial derivative 
is equal to zero of the Lagrangian, the, the partial derivative with respect to x2 is also equal to zero. The uh, constraint, which is uh, 16 minus x1 squared minus x2 squared, is large or equal to zero. And then we have our last condition, which is uh, the complementary slackness condition, which is a combination of lambda being large or equal to zero and lambda times the constraint, so constraint function, lambda times the constraint, constraint function. In our case, that would be lambda times 16 minus x1 squared minus x2 squared is equal to zero. Okay, so let's call these conditions, conditions one, two, three, and four. These are necessary conditions because any possible maximum, so, so any possible combination of x1 and x2 that wants to be a maximum has to meet all of these conditions. That's why they are called necessary. Right? If, no, any, if any combination of x1 and x2, any of these conditions is breached, it cannot be a constraint maximum. So just to reiterate what we mean here, any possible solution of x1 and x2 and actually lambda. Now that we have stated these necessary conditions, we can proceed to actually find which combinations of x1, x2 and lambda meet these conditions. In other words, we'll find the solutions and this will involve two steps. The first one, we'll try to find a solution with lambda equals to zero. And then the second step, we will try to find a solution with lambda larger than zero. So let's try this first step. So let's set lambda equal to zero and see how far this gets us and whether that delivers a solution. So when we set lambda to zero, then you can perhaps see that the um, partial derivatives in one and two simplify tremendously because they simplify to two for the first and negative three for the second. And now our conditions, necessary conditions, say that these should be equal to zero. Now clearly negative two, uh, two and negative three are not equal to zero. So very quickly we realize that uh, following the path of lambda equals zero, we have no solution. And remember, f of x1, x2 is a plane and it has no maximum without constraints. So that all makes sense. Therefore, we continue to the second part of our solution finding strategy, the case where lambda is equal, uh, sorry, where lambda can be larger than zero. Remember, it has to be larger or equal to zero. It cannot be smaller than zero. So what we do here is we'll take our uh, first order partial derivatives again, equation one, and we solve it for lambda. So when we do that with equation one, we get lambda is equal to one over x1. So we have brought the lambda part over to the other side of the equation and then divided by uh, one over, over two times x1. And that's what we get. Then for the second equation, when we solve that for lambda, we get negative three over two uh, x2. So negative three over two x2. Both of them are equal to lambda, or equations for lambda, so we can equate the two right-hand sides. We get one over x1 is equal to negative three over two times x2. And we could solve that one, for instance, for x2. You could solve for x1 as well, but let's solve for x2. And we get x2 is equal to negative three over two times x1. So we will use this in a moment and substitute into something. Now into what will we substitute? Remember that when lambda is larger than zero, then our complementary slackness condition 
implies that g will have to be exactly equal to zero because the product of lambda times g has to equal zero. So one of the two of them has to be zero. If it's not lambda, then it got to be g. So in this case, we are operating on the boundary of the constraint. And therefore g, the constraint function, has to be equal to zero. Into this, we will now substitute our found solution for x2. So let us state our constraint. 16 minus x1 squared minus x2 squared. But instead of x2 squared, we'll now substitute from our asterisk equation. So it's negative 3 over 2x1, and we square that. So that has to be equal to 0. So that's equal to zero. Uh, let me actually write this zero on the left hand side. So I have some space to do a little bit more simple algebra on the right hand side. So that is equal to zero. And let's simplify on the right hand side. We get 16 minus x1 squared, negative 3 over 2x1, and that squared is just 9 over 4x1 squared and we still have that negative and that is just uh, 16 minus 13 over 4x1 squared. This can now be solved for uh, x1 squared on the left hand side. x1 squared is equal to 16 times 4 over 13 or that is of course just the same as uh, 64 over 13. So here yeah, we have a quadratic equation x1 it's a particularly simple one so we just need to take the square root of the right hand side and therefore a solution to a solution to x1 is square root of uh, 64 over 13 which is 8 over square root 13. Of course we should recognize that the solution could also be negative that. So an alternative solution is x1 is equal to negative 8 over square root of 13. So we have two potential solutions we're looking at here. So for each of those we now need to check what the uh, respective values for x2 is. We use this equation up here. So x2 is equal to negative 3 over 2 times 8 over square root 13. And that gives us uh, negative 12 over square root 13. So that's part of the green solution. Let's move to the blue solution. What would x2 be in this case? x2 in this case would be 12 over square root 13. It's just a sign that is different. And now we will also have to solve for lambda because we need a value for lambda as well. We're looking at that equation 1, 1 over x1. So lambda here in the green solution is square root 13 over 8 and in the blue solution it would be negative square root 13 over 8. So we have a green solution, a potential green solution, and a potential blue solution. Okay, solutions are these three values combined, values for x1, x2, and lambda. And here's the blue solution for x1, x2, and lambda. So here's a crucial step. This solution is not a viable one. And the reason is that lambda here is actually negative. But we know from our necessary conditions that lambda has to be large or equal to zero. And here we are in the case where we investigate that lambda is larger than zero. So a solution where we end up with a negative lambda is not compatible. Therefore, the only potential solution we have found is x1, x2 and lambda. I'll put the asterisks here because these are solutions to our problem of 8 over square root 13, negative 12 over square square root 13 and square root 13 over 8. So this is the solution to our problem. So why is this the solution to our problem? 
recall that we started out trying lambda equal to zero, but we quickly found that there was no solution associated with that possibility. Then we looked at B, lambda larger than zero, we found two solutions, the green one, the blue one, but only the green one was viable because the blue one actually breached one of our necessary conditions. So we ended up with our maximum, our constrained maximum. This is an interesting case because we only found a maximum here because we imposed the constraint. Because the unconstrained problem was graphically equivalent to a plane indicating that there is actually no unconstrained maximum. So only because of having a constraint we ended up with a maximum.